And now it's my pleasure to introduce Belle Boggs. Ms. Boggs is a writer and teacher originally from King William County, Virginia, where much of Mattapanai Queen is set. She holds an MFA from the University of California, Irvine, and her stories have appeared in the Paris Review, Glimmer Train, Oxford American, and numerous other literary journals and anthologies. Uh, Mattapanai Queen, her first book, is a collection of linked short stories set in and around the Mattapanai Reservation in King William County. The manuscript for the collection was awarded the prestigious Breadloaf Writers Conference Bakeless Prize, um, and Percival Everett, the fiction judge for the prize, writes of the book, um, it is always good to hear new voices, but the newness of a voice alone carries no literary value. These stories are good because they are strongly imagined, finely controlled, and well-crafted. These stories are good because they are true, true in that way that only good fiction can be. Well, thank you very much um, for coming. And um, uh, I'm going to read the stories in um, in the collection. Are a little most of them are a little long to read all at one time. So I'm going to read just the beginning of a short story called Jonas, and um, I'll just start there. Okay, Jonas. It came almost as a relief when Melinda's husband told her that he wanted the operation. At first, all she could think of was the thing itself, as pink and ugly and tender as a face crumpled from crying, and how she would never have to see it again. She thought not of what would replace it, but only of its absence, a blank space, missingness, like the infinite and mysterious black hole space she had seen on Nova. Melinda resolved her features into a look of utter surprise as Jonas, coached in his words no doubt by that Richmond therapist, carefully unspooled his case like the most ordinary and obvious yarn. So what you're saying, Melinda repeated slowly, not looking at her husband. They were sitting in bed on a Sunday morning. Yellow sunlight streamed onto the unread newspaper. What you're saying is you've never felt right down there. Jonas explained patiently that it was not about down there. It was less about that than about his whole body not feeling right. Could Melinda imagine what it would feel like to have never felt like a girl, like a woman, if every time she put on her cheerleading uniform, she felt more like putting on football pads, cleats, a helmet? No, Melinda said flatly. She could not. She had coached state championship cheerleading teams eight of the last 15 years, hot rolled her hair every morning of her life past age 13, carried 20 odd shades of eyeshadow in her purse. But she had been thinking lately that if anything ever happened to Jonas, she would never seek another man's company, less out of loyalty to Jonas than out of mere tiredness. He was already taking the hormones, he told her. Already he could feel changes in his body, a softening of something, coarse hair turning fine as silk. Tell me about how you felt in that moment. Melinda had agreed to see Jonas's therapist in private sessions to help ease the transition. Seeing a therapist made her feel sort of stupid, but she agreed with Jonas that it was good to know what she was in for. Melinda shrugged, afraid of say to say too much, afraid of, saying of sounding country or simple. She was also afraid she might start crying for no reason, though she felt fine. This happened sometimes at the gynecologist's. The therapist had long brown hair pulled into a low and glo glossy ponytail, white, white teeth. Under other circumstances, Melinda might have felt jealous that her husband was spending so much alone time with such a smart and attractive woman. Jonas says you're taking it quite well, that you are unbelievably supportive, in fact. Melinda smiled. Did you feel that this was somehow inevitable? She thought about it for a minute, then said, no, I mean, I've always known that Jonas was sort of different, the quiet type. My first husband was loud. She looked up, waiting for the therapist to say something. But she was only waiting, expectant, so Melinda continued, I think Partly, I took it so well because I'd just come home from my sister's. Her husband bosses her so much. Get me a beer, where's my pants, etc. She said in a quieter voice, and my last husband, my daughter's daddy, he drank and he cheated. But Jonas has been a faithful husband for 10 years, the therapist said. 
Is that not right? No, it is. Then there's no reason to believe. Well, it isn't that, not really. It's more the other thing. I'm tired of being bossed by men, and I'm used to taking things as they come. The therapist nodded with a concerned and gentle frown, but Melinda thought she did not understand. She did not look like she had ever been bossed by men. Before Melinda left, on the hour to the minute she noticed, the therapist asked her in a delicate way if she had questions of any kind about the process, the procedures. Melinda shook her head vehemently. She did have questions, primarily about what would be expected in the bedroom and about down there, but she was too shy to ask them. She could not help thinking, as she left, that if the therapist had been truly good and smart, as Jonas said, she would have known that and made her ask them anyway. Telling Jessica, her daughter, was the hardest part. For one thing, Jonas had been the primary daddy that Jessica had known past age 10, and Melinda thought that this was probably the hardest news you could hear about a father. It didn't seem right, Melinda said, for Jonas to tell her. She would do it herself, just as she had talked to Jesse about her period and boys and sex. This fell into that category, she felt. Jonas had done the normal dad things. He'd taught her to drive, had chaperoned dances at the high school, had told Jessie's dates to have her home by 11, then 12 as she got older. He had even walked her down the aisle, which was possibly the proudest moment in Melinda's life. It had been Jessie's choice to give him that honor, and Melinda had been the one to choose Jonas. Melinda did not want to tell anyone else first, and she could not imagine keeping such an important piece of news a secret. When it was not competition season, she spent half her mornings on the telephone, and the person she talked to most was Jessica. She called her when she found a funny piece of news in the local paper, and when she was feeling down, and when she heard gossip about the neighbors. She'd told her when Jonas had irritable bowel syndrome and had to sit on that funny donut-shaped pillow for a month. Jessie was the first to know anything Melinda knew. Later, Melinda would wish she had told Jessie in a more properly formal way than how she did it over the phone, spooning sliced peaches onto a pan of chicken. It just came out. Jonas is getting an operation to become a woman, a sex change. She had hoped that telling Jessie would finally give her someone to talk to about it, someone to be concerned about her, But what she heard from the other end of the line was Jessie's phone clattering to the floor. It took several calls before she would answer again, and by then she was crying, and she was the one who had to be consoled. But what will people think, Mama? Melinda shrugged, licking peach syrup from her fingers. This county has had to get used to a lot of things, she said. There was a country store owner who'd married the 16-year-old and set her up working the counter. Countless teen pregnancies, a few of them from Melinda's own cheering squads, an accounting scandal with the county supervisors, a professor who moved here from Richmond and flew a rainbow flag. Her best friend had had her ski boat sunk by a jealous ex-husband. The way Melinda saw it, this was a small and superficial change, no more unnatural than the fertility pills Jessica had been taking for six months, the half dozen fertilized eggs she'd had implanted in her womb. He still loves me, honey, just the same as he did. But Kevin's congregation, Jesse wailed, they will not get used to this. Oh, it's easy for Jonas. He's retired, but some people still have to work in this town. Melinda did not mention that she still worked and that high school cheerleaders were not known to be the most open-minded bunch. Jessica had married the county's most popular Baptist church's self-righteous and smirking youth minister. Neither Melinda nor Jonas liked him much, though Jonas wouldn't say so, but it had been clear all along that Jessica was smitten. Melinda wanted to explain something about that, how when you love someone, it didn't matter what other people thought. But on reflection, she realized that wasn't it exactly. There was something more complicated that she herself barely understood. And expecting a 22-year-old to understand was probably pointless. It was more like 
You come into this world, you go out alone. You come into this world alone and you go out alone. But it wasn't exactly that either. Well, I wish you wouldn't take it so hard, Melinda said, but I understand why you are. It was a shock to me too. She could hear Jesse sniffling. Hopefully, she asked, do you want me to come over? No, Jesse said in a calmer voice. The doctor says I should not get upset. He says stress is the enemy of conception. All right, sweetie. Melinda felt her own tears starting, tipped her head back. You mustn't cry, she told herself. Think of your grandchildren. He says I should isolate myself from my stress factors, Jessica said ominously. Melinda could not help wondering how such a smart girl could have married a man who put vanity plates on his truck. Revkev, they said. A sex change is not an overnight thing, Melinda learned. First, there are months of hormone therapy coaxing the body into its new self through small and incremental changes, small surgeries leading up to the big one. Before you even have one surgery, there is a period of dress up, drag they called it, so you get used to the feeling of being different, of being looked at. The first time Jonas went out in drag, they took the doctor's sensible advice and made it an out of town and not overly formal or overly long appearance, shopping for pillow shams at the Ashland Walmart and dinner at the Ashland Ponderosa. Melinda thought bought Jonas a smart new mint green pantsuit. None of her clothes would fit him, helped him style the ash blonde wig he'd bought, and powdered his face and eyelids, and even gave him a touch of blush and lip gloss. She was careful not to overdo it. When she was finished, she looked, rather as she expected, like an older, mannish woman. She realized, rubbing a bit of thick gloss away from his bottom lip, that she had probably never touched him there, not with her fingertips, never touched his soft and crepey eyelids or the high, sharp ridge of his cheekbones. Am I beautiful yet, he asked, his voice still manly, husky. He laughed, as if to dismiss the notion. You'll do, she said. You do the talking, okay? He asked in a whisper voice on their way out. Melinda nodded. She even drove. Melinda did not think she'd had so much fun in years. First, shopping at Walmart, Jonas meek beside her in the brightly lit aisles. With a new and keen interest, he watched her finger the fabrics, place flowered pattern next to solid rug or curtain material, and did not once check his watch. He wasn't wearing a watch. His watch was a man's. No one seemed to notice his large, still hairy hands or his Adam's apple. Melinda told her sister later that was because women from Caroline County were so damn ugly. <laughs> At dinner, he ate slowly, carefully, cutting his steak and bringing it right to his mouth in the continental style. Melinda was put in mind of a delicate, long-lost aunt come to visit or a sister you didn't have to compete with in looks. She smiled at him across the table, but they didn't speak. They spent an entire hour and 15 minutes at the Ponderosa, lingering over black coffee for Jonas and an ice cream sundae for Melinda. Normally, Jonas would raise his finger for the check before she'd even taken her last bite. To save time, he always said. Time for what, she used to wonder. At a table across from them, new parents took turns feeding their baby. She thought of Jessica and Kevin, said a little useless prayer for a grandchild. She was sure it was played, prayed for plenty. Later, in the car, she asked him what he wanted to be called. Joni? Joan, I think, he said. He put his hand over hers, which rested on the gear shift, and patted it. Even his palm felt softer to Melinda. You can call me Jonas still, Melinda. I don't have to always. She gave him her sweet martyr look. Like I told your therapist, I'm used to taking things as they come. When in bed, he reached for her. She kissed him chastely, then turn turned over. But clearly, you would prefer he stay a man, her sister Pauline said over the telephone. 
Well, said Melinda, it's not up to me, but secretly. I want Jonas to be happy. Melinda had come out with Jonas's news to just about everyone who mattered, and she had never in her life been told so many times how amazing and strong she was. She'd even told her cheering squad, carefully explaining that it didn't mean Jonas was gay. Melinda explained to Pauline that Jonas, Joan, was like a new person. He was willing to go out more, and he laughed and smiled more than he ever had. He spent less, less time alone. He cooked, though not well. He wanted to learn new things. Could she imagine a man who did things with you not because he had to, but because he wanted to? It sounds like what you're saying, Pauline said snippily, is that we should, all, we should hope all our husbands get a sex change. Melinda tried again. Did she remember what it was like to raise a child when it was very young? How you could teach them one thing, like how to use a flower sifter, and it kept them entertained for hours. How every day they learned something new, and just learning it delighted them. It was sort of, a little bit, like that. Well, I still don't think I'd want Roland getting his thing chopped off. Vulgar, Melinda thought. Her sister was so vulgar. The thing that is still on my mind, Melinda began, a little too quick and businesslike it felt, is that my daughter is not speaking to us exactly. The therapist nodded, leaned back in her chair. That's normal under the circumstances. Well, it does not feel normal to me, Melinda said. She had dressed up more for this visit, thinking a more powerful presence would exact better advice from this woman. She had what she called high hair, the kind of hair that she required her girls to wear for competition. It looked good on the field. It made people remember you. I talk to my daughter every day, Melinda said proudly. Every day, the therapist repeated. That is quite a schedule. Melinda did not expect this woman to understand or come from a place where daughters were their mother's best friends, boys their fathers. She did not want to talk about why that might be a problem in the therapist's eyes. How does Jonas feel about your daughter's rejection? He's shy about it, Melinda said. She explained how it wasn't Jonas exactly who had told her, how Jonas didn't really like to talk about it to anyone. She told the therapist about Kevin and how she didn't think Jonas had ever really cared for him, though of course they wished Jessica well. I think he wants to just be a woman, a new person, and that's that. Sometimes I think... Melinda looked at the clock, noticed she had seven minutes left. Sometimes I think maybe he's practicing with us. The therapist shook her head, not comprehending. Feeling her eyes begin to sting, Melinda decided quickly to ration the rest of her time to Jessica. My daughter used to have this amazing memory. Not for things like history and formulas, for math or school. She was on a roll and all, but that wasn't the amazing part. It was for little details, like if you were remembering so-and-so's wedding, she could tell you exactly what you wore, what everybody wore. It was this talent she had. So now she's married to this reverend, and she wears sweatpants to the grocery store, and goes out without her hair done, and lies on her side all day, and gives herself injections in the butt. And she won't talk to me for more than a second now when I call, says she has to go in this short way. I accepted all of that, she said, her voice breaking. I accepted it because she was happy. The therapist nodded, but said nothing. Melinda wanted to say that she was happy now, too, but the words did not come. Melinda had pictured therapy before Jonas started going as a place where you could go and get your embarrassing questions answered. You could say, for example, why did my father drink and whore around? Or why did my uncle abuse me? And the therapist would have an answer. You could say, what does life mean? And he would know what you needed to hear. If you told him your worst and weirdest dreams, he would tell you what they meant. Make you feel better. Normal. Why else would it cost so much? Driving home, air conditioning cooling her bare arms and blowing back her high hair, Melinda knew what she wished she had asked. How old do you have to be to understand how love works? 
Jonas began therapy after suffering a panic attack at work more than a year before. He had been a trucker, hauling lumber to Chesapeake Paper Company, and one day he pulled over and decided he was having a heart attack. He knelt in the weeds on Route 30 and clutched his chest until the feeling passed, then drove himself and his whole rig to the hospital. When the test results came up clear, the specialist at Tidewater Memorial had referred him to therapy. And that was that. Melinda wondered if Jonas would have ever made this decision without the therapist leading him there. Another woman, she thought, might be angry with the therapist, angry with Jonas for having a fake heart attack when he was supposed to be working, and for taking an early retirement, and for having something as inconvenient as the mind of a woman inside the body of a man. Surely she would be angry. Maybe, Melinda thought, turning onto her favorite back road, shortcut. They should have a get-together. Not at their house, but at someone else's so that Jesse and Kevin could see how they were accepted by other normal, reasonably Christian people. It would be sort of like a debutante's coming out, with Jonas in his modest, school marmish drag, so that Kevin and Jesse could see that it wasn't about blue eyeshadow and fishnets and six-inch heels, so that they could see that it wasn't about sex. Melinda sped up the straightaway, where she had always tried to get the car up to 60. There was a dip in the road. If you were going fast enough, you lost your stomach in the most pleasant way. Jonas's voice was steadily growing softer and higher. He spoke in a half whisper and had become almost neat in his habits, folding his clothes and wiping crumbs from the countertops. It was almost like he knew that he was too big to be a woman and was trying somehow to contain himself, to leave less of his bigness and coarseness behind. Melinda found that she bossed him more, telling him what their plans were for the weekend, what movie she'd like to see. He acquiesced, generally. Doing laundry, she noticed that even his sweat had a sweeter smell, more feminine. He was plucking his eyebrows now and using a depilatory on his arms and legs and face. Melinda bought him a special astringent to shrink his pores and a cold cream that cost $20 a jar. It had been nearly a month since she'd told Jessica, and she still had not talked to either of them for more than a minute. She'll come around, Jonas said. Just wait. But aren't you sad, Melinda asked. Don't you miss her? Of course I do. You can't make people talk to you. Meanwhile, Jonas had joined a support group in Richmond, and Melinda was tired of waiting. The group met two nights a week next to a tattoo parlor on the south side, and Jonas would be gone on those Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 in the afternoon until 9 or 10 at night. Sometimes we get a beer afterwards, he explained. On the south side, Melinda asked. She had a big picture of that. There was a separate support group for partners, Jonas said, but Melinda told him she needed to think about next year's routines, at least for now. So she stood outside in the backyard in her shorts and t-shirt and did jumps and kicks, listened to her boombox as the sun sank lower and lower behind the water tower. She played old favorites from CNC Music Factory and Janet Jackson and Salt and Peppa, n- jotted notes down on a pad, doodled her own name in big, curvy letters. When the grass grew too high, making her legs itch, she mowed it. At first, she was annoyed that Jonas had neglect- neglected the task, but she found that she liked the challenge of starting the motor, liked the feel of pushing and pulling a great weight, of cutting. And the more she thought about it, the more she liked the term partner. It sounded more democratic, more freeing than wife. I'm going to stop there. Would you like to know how it became a book? Okay. (laughs) So, um... (laughs) <laughs> well, I um, went to um, MFA school in um, California at UC Irvine, and um, I wrote a novel as my MFA thesis. And um, after that, I was in, I, mo- I had moved to New York City, and I was teaching in, um, in Brooklyn and at an elementary school. 
and um, my novel like didn't sell and that was fine you know it's like a learning process so I started working on these short stories the year after the summer after I um, taught first grade and um, so I would go to the New York Public Library every day and work on my computer and I was just really enjoying writing about they're all set um, in the two counties where I grew up which um, are King William County and King and Queen County and I was really enjoying working on these stories and um, after another a year of working on them I moved to North Carolina um, with my husband and I was teaching GED classes then and I was working more and more and I thought oh that's great I have a collection after a while it seemed like they were done but um, I had an agent at the time, and he said, well, you know, he wasn't that into short stories. So, um, <laughs> or he wasn't that into me, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> so I thought, oh, shoot, well, I'll write another book. And um, meanwhile, teaching, and I, then I moved to D.C. Um, we were moving for work, and um, I was teaching at a KIPP school in D.C. in Shaw. I was really busy. I had never imagined, if you would like your, I mean, KIPP is great, but, you know, if you value your spare time, it's really hard. <laughs> so um, it's a great thing to do, but it's a, it's a, it's hard. So my husband was like, "Well, I think you should send these stories to a contest or something." I was like, "Yeah, yeah," and um, and I didn't do anything with them. And I came home one night. And it was winter time, or it was like late winter. It's cold, and there was a message on the machine that was that it was a finalist for the Bakeless Prize, and I didn't know that he submitted it for me. I had no idea. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it was, it was really nice. It was, you know, that's an understatement. <laughs> so then it was great. I was on spring break when I f heard from Michael Collier that it won. But um, so it was great because I was able to share that with my students. I was a writing teacher of fifth grade, which was when I had first decided that I wanted to be a writer. So it was a really great thing to share with my students. And anyway, so that's how it became a book. Well, the, the title Mattapani Queen, um, the Mattapani River is a river um, in Virginia that um, it's the Mat, the Mat, the Ta, the Po, and the Nye, like are the three tributaries that form the Mattapani, and um, they run in between uh, King William and King and Queen and feed into the York. And um, the um, Mattapani Indian Reservation is also on the Mattapani River. It's a very, it's like one of the most pristine rivers, coastal rivers in, on the East Coast. Um, but there's a boat, or there really was a real boat called the Mattapani Queen. Um, that I remember from growing up in Walkerton that it had been like kind of like a pleasure cruiser boat and it's in one it's in a couple of the stories like three of the stories um, are about well not about but there this boat appears because one character is trying very hard to buy the boat from someone else who doesn't want you know to get rid of it for various reasons. I sort of came to it later. I didn't. Um, I wrote one of these short stories when I was in workshop. Uh, the very last story in the collection. I was just thinking about um, um, this egg man that we had, and just thinking about the town that I live in. And I it was three pages, and I wrote it. And I didn't think that I would write any more about it. But then I just started thinking, you know, kind of coming up with characters and thinking about the place. And also at the time, um, I was um, just, well, at the time, there was a lot of um, concern about, and there still is, about the Mattapani River, because Newport News wants to build a reservoir that will um, take the rivers, a lot of the river's depth, and will be very harmful to um, the Mattapani Indians who depend on the river. And I was thinking also about, like, people I was, I'd gone to high school with, and what their lives were kind of becoming and so I was just kind of thinking a lot about that and that's sort of where how it got started. I think a lot because um, like when I um, when I first went to um, when I first moved to California I remember going I had been there before but I had never been to Los Angeles and I was like oh this is terrible <laughs> and <laughs> I went and I was gonna live in Long Beach and I went to the beach and I met this surfer and I was trying to be friendly and I was talking to him and he, he said where are you from And I said I'm from Virginia and he said is that on the coast and I was like <laughs> really worried <laughs> so so I thought and I remember that Jeffrey Wolf who was my in my who was a workshop leader for me in my first the first letter to me he like scrawled are you lonesome for the tidewater and I was like 
oh, no. <laughs> and, but I also felt kind of emotional about it. So I was like, well, maybe I should be. But, um, but it, it also has helped. I mean, I have met a lot of people. I'm a, just a regular teacher. Like, I don't teach at universities. I teach usually in middle schools. And right now I'm teaching in a high school. And so I meet a lot of different people. And I'm, I teach all different kinds of things like GD, first grade, high school, fifth grade. And so I meet all these interesting people when I move. I'm pretty settled in North Carolina now, but I would be glad to talk to anybody about, I know a lot of people are kind of down, sometimes people are very, even people with MFAs are sort of down on the MFA experience. But for me, I mean, um, uh, it, it was just such a great opportunity to go and work with writers and to have time to write. And Irvine is really, really um, supportive of their students, even now where the UC funding has, has kind of disappeared. They still fully fund their students and, you know, help you learn how to teach. And they also do a lot of outreach. I mean, that's how I got into teaching younger students. I was teaching in a program called Humanities Out There that was um, – in the community of Santa Ana, and so that's how I got interested in doing that. But I, I, I loved the whole experience. I was able to spend three years there, and the teach the all the teachers there take it really seriously. And then they also have great other programs you can take classes in. I mean, there are a lot of great programs, but I think that that they're really special, and it's really small too. Like there are only six people in each year. It's kind of nice. Well, I don't. I think I say some things. If, I mean, I don't even think of myself as having an accent because my dad is from West Virginia, so he has a stronger accent. I think the other people in my family have a stronger accent than me, but, um, but I think there's a tidewater sort of accent. I I think. I mean, you know, I tend to teach. Um, in schools that are pretty needy and so a lot of times I spend you know stand on my head trying to get kids to like writing and because it hasn't really you know unfortunately the great you know things that people can do in reading and writing are not necessarily done in our neediest classrooms I think that New York City is doing a, a great job in them there are lots of places that are but it's just so spotty for kids who who are in title one schools which is where I tend to teach so um, you know, I think it will change more now that I'm teaching, I mean, that I'll be teaching high school. So um, I'll have a chance to read a lot of the, you know, the, I'll can make my students read the same things that I read. <laughs> but uh, and I should do a little bit of that with, um, with fifth grade, which was like my specialty for a while. But, um, but there you, I mean, the way that teachers try to teach writing and reading now is through process-based writing, which is what you learn, you know, it's like workshops. So we did a writer's workshop and a reader's workshop, and that was my favorite part of the classroom teaching. I'm working, thank you, um, I'm working on a novel now that's set in Virginia, in Richmond, in the, that's a historical novel. I'm trying to work on some research. But, um, so that's what I'm working on now. I really, I love writing short stories because I was, you can, you know, there, there's like a light at the end of the tunnel and you kind of imagine the whole thing at once. And some people are really good at that with novel writing where they like know everything that's going to happen. But I don't, I just write, you know, start to finish and I try to figure it out as I go along. But I like working on a novel because the characters, you can kind of think, you know, you can, just spend so much time with the characters. And I think that's why a lot of the characters in these stories appear in other stories in the book, because I just wanted to continue to work with them. So that's sort of how it became a collection, was that I started wanting, after I wrote one, I would want a character more to say about a character that was not the point of view character, and things like that. Um, the, um, there are um, a couple of characters who grew up and lived or moved away from and came back to the Indian Reservation, and I spent some time on the Mattapani Indian Reservation. I mean, King William's a really, like, it's not a small county, but not that many people live there. There's, like, one elementary school and one elementary middle and one high school, and that's it for the entire county. So all of the different cultural things about the community you know, you have an opportunity to l learn about all of them because there's just not that much else to do. So, you know, that was a part of, you know, 
my growing up, you know, knowing people, and then I was able to spend time with some people on the Indian Reservation to find out a little bit more about how, how land worked there and things like that. I think my favorite living writer is Edward P. Jones, and um, I just like, I just adore his writing and it's also kind of particular I mean it's special to me also because it's that North Carolina Virginia DC area that I've spent so much time in I think you can reread his stories and they're like novels and I love his novel too and um, um, from the south Flannery O'Connor uh, Eudora Welty um, I really love um, Richard Yates and um, those are like writers I can think of off the top of my head. Alice Monroe is a short story writer, you know, so those are like, I th would say my, my top favorites, top five, I guess. I've had, I had one class, I was just teaching this one class this past sem semester of um, English students um, who were seniors and we were reading Southern women writers. So I, I, they wanted, and this was before my book came out, so because it hasn't been out for very long, so they wanted, I, gave them a copy of a short story because they asked me and we were talking and they were writing short stories too um, but uh, I think I would just like let it be on the shelf and if they wanted to borrow it they can borrow it but I don't want to make them read it I would rather them going to read Edward P. Jones or <laughs> Flannery O'Connor <laughs> but um, but so yeah we'll see I'm, I'm excited to to make them read a lot of stuff it's a really it's a struggle for me because not because the universities are like beating down my door or anything, but uh, because um, when I first started, I, I have taught composition and creative writing, and that was part of the, you know, that's at the Irvine, that's part of the experience, and I was like, I was really young when I went to school, so I was not that much, you know, I was right out of college, and and I just thought well, that I was unprepared to do it, and I felt, you know, kind of like fraud, and I don't think I would feel that way so much now, but it kind of pushed me in the direction of wanting to learn, first of all, like, why are college freshmen such bad writers? Where, you know, where does that come from? I mean, probably here they're good writers, but, at, <laughs> I mean, Irvine is a good school, and they were not, they, it was really unintelligible, and it was, and so I was trying to figure that out, and then, you know, why are they so not interested in, like, what I'm trying to get them to read? So I wanted to figure that out, so I started working with younger kids, and I also, like, really have a, I mean, I try to work somewhere where I'm needed and it's not like a thousand people trying to work there you know somewhere where like I fit in and I'm needed but on the other hand it's really really hard to have a writing schedule and teach you know from 7 30 in the morning until three four o'clock and then plan the next day it's like giving four presentations in a day and then planning four more for the next day so it's hard but um but then you know, it's rewarding too. So I don't know. I guess we'll. See. I'll. I th I think about it, but I don't know. And I will apply for jobs that are in my North Carolina area. <laughs> we'll see what happens.